this is like a fractal, like a fractal existence. And so the 3D layers, the 4D layers, the 5D layers, all these other layers that we're not even talking about today, they continue forever, like eternally. It's just where our collective is kind of bumping up and even the earth plane is kind of shifting. Welcome to Shifting Dimensions. I'm, I'm really excited to speak with you. You, you know, you call yourself a mystic um, and you've been doing, you know, work in the intuitive space since 1999. And I think the word mystic really captures the fact that you're an intuitive healer, 5D astrologer, medium teacher, yoga instructor, and a holistic health practitioner and a bunch of other things too. So how did you go from being an IPO trader, you know, <laughs> to being a mystic? That's a great question. Well, I've, um, you know, I've always been, I've been this way my whole life, intuitive. Of course, I, I didn't know that. I thought everybody was like this. And, um, and then I realized not everybody practices it. And now I'm back to, yes, everybody can be this way. But uh, in the times that I didn't believe it, I was, you know, just living life and surviving. And I was working in the brokerage industry. And I was great with numbers and that's what helped me to survive. But while I was in that space, um, it, it's very much that my body uh, needed some healing. Like I couldn't really keep up with that pace and the types of foods I was eating. And I was kind of partying, you know, living that party life. My body's like, mm, no, it's not working for you. So I had to find a way to health. And in Chicago in the 90s, that was, that was pretty hard. Um, so I, I found my way to organic foods. And um, doing yoga, getting massage, and I was reading, I started like reading kind of religious books to help support me because I had kind of like a tricky life um, growing up. So it was more uh, religious, but then it went into spiritual. So all, all my paths kind of led me back to who I was in the first place. And then come uh, 1999, I moved to California and I'm like, you know, while I'm working as a broker, IPO trader, series seven, series 63. I think I'm going to go to school at night to become a massage therapist. And it all started from there. So you said that you've been intuitive your whole life. So right. were you aware that it was intuition? Because I also know that you're, and let me know if I'm wrong. I think you're also like a medium and a psychic as well. So did you have, were you having experiences as a child that seemed out of the ordinary? I did. But again, I remember, I'll tell you one of the first stories I have. I was, gosh, about five or six years old. And my mother and I, I'm adopted. So it was the, my mother who adopted me. We were going actually to um, a place where we were going to take pictures for like, a, you know, a little philanthropy thing that the cradle where I was adopted from, they were having this. It was like a little modeling show. And so uh, we're driving there and Granted, this is the 70s, okay? <laughs> there was no GPSs, none of that. And so my mom's trying to find her way. We hadn't been there before. And the whole time I'm telling her about this dream that I had had the night before. And I, I saw what the place looked like and, you know, was explaining the house. And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we all of a sudden we pull up, we get there and she just froze because it was everything that I had been telling her on the way there. And so when, when we get there and I'm like, oh, it's it. You know, I don't remember exactly, but I was really excited. And, and, um, she didn't say anything. It's just, it, you know, it startled her, like in her defense, it would be kind of a little creep, you know, creepy and it's a little scary. <laughs> so, so she didn't say anything. And I interpreted that as that it wasn't good because I, I kept at it, you know, and it kept getting shut down. So that was, um, I think my first realization that not everybody that, that what I, what had just happened there wasn't okay. Wasn't normal. Or I don't even know if I interpreted it that way. I just knew it wasn't right. So I just kept my mouth shut. So things like that continue to happen throughout my childhood. But I, you know, again, you don't, you just think everybody's the same way as you until you really realize that that's not true. So Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think I've all, I was like that to myself. I would have certain experiences and I'd want to talk about it. And it was just kind of like, what are you talking about? That's weird. Like you're thinking in the clouds, you know? So 
I, I think it's interesting because I do think a lot of people have intuitive experiences, some more extreme than others, but I think the default setting is just to kind of like push it down and be like, oh, that's, or gaslight themselves. Like, oh, that really didn't happen that way. Or that's not what I just saw or thought. So um, it makes sense that you felt that way. So, you know, fast forward to you being an IPO trader, you were just feeling burnt out, I should say. And then you started seeking relief. So like looking, you started off with what you were eating, then you went to kind of like um, religious texts, then you got your certification in massage therapy. When did you start feeling bold enough to kind of go more deeper into other intuitive or spiritual type of work? Because I know you're also like a Reiki healer and mm -hmm. you do a lot of other things too, and you're an astrologer. So when did you start getting the courage to start going that way, especially growing up feeling like you couldn't really speak about your intuitive capabilities? Right. Well, it, it kind of all started to happen really, um, dare I say all at that same time when I was going to massage school, I was going at night. So I was still doing like the IPO trading during the day. And this was in California, in La Jolla, California. And then I saw, um, in the massage magazine, I saw Reiki and I saw the kanji symbols. I didn't know what that was. Like, there's really no internet back in the day like that. Like nobody was <laughs> like, what was that? But it was so cool. Like it looked just so appealing to me. Like something about it drew me in. And so I'm like, hmm, okay, I'm going to get Reiki trained. Like that is literally like, it felt so true to my heart. And I called the Reiki Alliance and found a woman who had the same initials as me. And she turned out to be um, somebody who had done Reiki for 30, 40 years of her life. And she knew uh, uh, um, Phyllis Fujimoto, which is um, Hawaii Takata, the woman who brought Reiki over from Japan into the Americas. That was her granddaughter. So it was from the exact Usui lineage. And I was so grateful to have worked with her. I mean, she was traditional Reiki one, two, and three, and you have to do one first. You got to wait a few months before you do two. And then you have to wait a couple of years before you do three, because it takes a while for the energy to adjust. So when I started to get around that and I experienced it for myself, it just started to change my life. And then when I went to massage school, this is when it really happened. Again, great teachers. Here I have my hands on people doing work and I would start to see things and feel things, but I'm like, that's just my, that's just my mind wandering. I'm just being, you know, I have a good imagination. Like how you said, you just tell yourself these things. And my teachers would say, Janine, are you seeing something? What are you noticing? What are you seeing? And I was like, how do they know? And they would tell me what it is. And they said, you know, just come on, get it out just say it. You have to trust it. And so what had happened was, you know, it was my environment. It was all here. And I just needed somebody to be able to draw it out of me to help me feel comfortable with it. And so remembering that so, so fondly, I, I know that is the biggest, that is such a big component of becoming. So this is what I share with my clients the most. If I could reflect it back to them. No, that's not weird. Nope. You're right on. Whoop. I see you doing that. It, they feel stronger and more empowered, but that is how I was able to really trust it. That makes a lot of sense. And I was going to ask, do you think that these types of gifts, do you think they're innate or do you think that some people have to learn it? Honestly, I feel like I'm a canary in the coal mine. We, this is our birthright. That is my whole self-belief in all the years too that I've been practicing it. It is our birthright. And yet um, I, I feel like what it is, is we have to um, unlearn the conditioning that has covered it up. And what that conditioning really is, is putting our authority out there. It's good to have structure in life. But putting so much of this trained belief that, no, we don't know what we need. We don't know what we want. The teacher knows. This guy knows. That guy knows. This one knows. We put so much out there that we have learned, learned, like to untrust ourselves. But like a child, if we had been supported in that, 
we would have really kept that um, innate capacity more alive, for sure. I think you're right. I think that's something that I'm trying to find my way back to, which is just understanding myself and really trusting myself and not constantly looking for external validation, people co-signing what my intuition is telling me or what I'm seeing, whether it's visions and dreams, whatever it might be. It's something that I'm really trying to learn how to do. And I think a lot of people disconnect from that that part of themselves. And I think that could also potentially lead to some mental health um, and personal development issues. So yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I want to get into something that you you said. Um, and I think in your work and something that you're passionate about talking about is the fact that everything is energy first. What do you mean by that? It, to me, it is the crux of this new world that you, you know, in the spiritual community, you hear a lot of people speaking to that, like a new world experience, but everything is energy first is really a concept that both scientists, I feel, and psychics, dare I say, or the spiritual can actually agree upon. It, it just, it's just the fabric of our universe. However, the way that we've been, um, you know, um, brought up to believe or the way we've been oriented for whatever reason is that we got to go to the physical first. But from my perspective, and even from ancient studies, like I've studied traditional Chinese medicine and in Ayurvedic medicine and other, other, you know, older, um, holistic practices, there is the spiritual body, the mental body and the emotional body first, even the soul, the soul is separate. It's the soul is all those, but those bodies are very etheric in nature. And those bodies, they project the denser holograph of that we call physical. And you, you know, you could see that, you know, you hear the words mind body connection or somatic experience is the fancy word for mind body connection. And we say those words, but what does that really mean? Our, our mind, our emotions, our spirit, our will, it's projecting the body. And so if we meet everything on that energetic level first, before the physical, then we have a chance to kind of adjust the physical or get to it before it hits that dense level of the physical layer. Because once it gets to physical, it is deep. Another thing that you said that you're passionate about is helping your clients remove the veil from all things behind the veil. So does that kind of go into that whole aspect of understanding that everything is energy first and kind of like we're the spiritual aspect of our human being? Oh, no, completely. And it's funny that you should use those words. You are you are so intuitive, Jumi, because <laughs> you're saying so many things that are kind of rolling around in my noggin. But um. No, I have the saying that says the most spiritual thing we can do is to be human. And typically people are like, oh, human, yuck. I want to go be spiritual. I'm like, okay, that's cool. <laughs> but I fully believe the most spiritual thing we could do is be human because it's the roots. This is just the dense matter of the whole expression of what we are. And so when you start to reorient people into meeting the energetic first, then they might not even need some of these physical remedies, you know, that just deals with the symptom. They get to the root of it. They get to the essential nature. A good example of this would be, for instance, the concept of law of attraction. And I started studying that again at the end of 99 in the beginning of 2000. And I loved it. I mean, that there's a great truth there. We are, I mean, everything is magnetic, right? So we are all constantly attracting. But the way it's been used is that, you know, we got to start thinking positive. We can't think negative. We can't think negative. And, and, I, and you got to look at it like, well, if everything is energy and we're a big ball of energy, that which we ignore is still coming with us everywhere. That which we don't want to say anything negative about because we just want to focus on the positive. That is still pinging a frequency. So the importance here is to go to the whole self go to it all 
because you will keep getting who you are, you know, wherever you go, there you are, you will keep getting it until it comes. And so when I remove that veil or just try to sneak it in there, invite them to see it that way, all of a sudden you get so empowered and you're not chasing results or answers as much. You just kind of go in here and really get to the bottom of it and do the work. That's interesting that you said that what we ignore continues to follow us. So if if I'm understanding correctly, what you're trying to say is that negative thoughts are just a part of being human, a human being. It's part of the human experience. But we have to confront those negative thoughts and figure out why they exist or where they're coming from, right? Are we trying to, we almost have to observe them in order to be able to release them. Is that what you mean? Exactly. I love that you said that. Highlight the word observe because it's, um, I don't mean that we have to go sit in them for too long, right? In the same way that we don't want to overly steep in too much of the positive. Anytime you're in an extreme, whether it's too positive or, oh my gosh, I don't want to be too negative. You're missing the point of integration. And so when we want to deny it it's it's why we're here like we are here because we can meet it differently granted sometimes if it's really hard or if it's an unhealthy extremely toxic situation we got to remove ourselves until we get a grasp of it and then somehow or another bits of it will come back around so we can meet it once we're strong enough by no means do i say you know put yourself in you know, in front of a moving vehicle or something like don't, don't go into a toxic environment, but it's about, um, also not being so afraid and staying away from it in a real hyperreactive sort of way either. So when we stay in a state that if we move towards a state or we're working towards a state of just complete perfection, where we're constantly positive all the time, are you saying that that's not realistic or that's not really, we still have to embrace some sort of duality. Yeah, this is about integration. And that even is what 5D is all about. It's about um, understanding the way I like to see it is uh, if we understand the necessity in 5D or, you know, that, that realm or that frequency is that, we understand the necessity for all of it, for all of it. And I sit here looking back on my life and the t- and I've had some hard times and we've all had our hard times. And I could look back on that and, and I could either shame myself, which I have tons of clients coming to me like, oh my gosh, I didn't law of attraction enough. I'm like, okay, hold on a minute. <laughs> hold on a minute. There's a hand of fate that comes in because that those hard times, you weren't supposed to law of attraction out of you were supposed to move through it because that is forming something in you that's that's going you're going to understand later on down the line when you're in it you let yourself feel it so it's really about being true with what you're feeling in every moment so instead of like overriding the feeling with a real happy thought um bring the happy thought with but then also be honest with yourself let it rise if you're mad be mad if you're upset be upset because if you don't get it up and out, it is going to stay there. A fun way to look at this, um, and I'll finish really quick, is pretend like you go out to eat, right? And, and you get a little doggy bag to come home with. And you're like, okay, I'll eat this burger like tomorrow or next couple of days. And it's in the back of the fridge. And the next day comes, you don't want it. The next day comes, you don't want it. And you're like, I shouldn't really get rid of it. It was really expensive. So I'm just going to, I know I'm going to eat it. But then days go by and you keep pushing it back further and further and further. Well, before you know it, it starts to get stinky. Right. And then you're like, well, uh, I'll just open my fridge really quick and close it, (laughs) get in and out of there really quick. And before you know it, you don't even go in the fridge anymore because you haven't dealt with it. And the same thing happens to us. If we don't get it up and out, it starts to change and shift and become worse. And before you know it, we tiptoe around it. We start to change our whole life. We're living in fear of what that is. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. And it's giving me a lot to actually think about because I always think that true healing, true spiritual ascension is just getting to a point where 
negative emotions just don't really rise up within you. And I do think to some extent, I think, you know, certain things that would normally stress you out when you've done a lot of work to heal and release, those things don't necessarily trigger you. But I do believe that negative emotions are signposts for us to pay attention to certain things. So if, if negative emotions are coming up, if I'm finding myself angry about a certain interaction with someone, it could be evidence that I keep putting myself in situations where maybe I'm getting taken advantage of. And that anger is to show me that, hey, you need to step away from this. You need to have a boundary here. Or if for some reason envy is coming up within me, that emotion is supposed to show me that maybe I should be working harder towards my goals. And maybe the envy is kind of showing me that, okay, this person has something that I aspire to have as well. And maybe I'm not putting in the work that I need to put in in order to achieve that for myself. So I see I see what you're saying. Like all of these things play a role. Doesn't mean we should stay in a field of complete negativity, but right. staying in a field of complete positivity could also be some sort of spiritual bypassing. Exactly. Okay, got it. That is so spot on. And And what you've done, what you know, is you take that awareness and you're like, oh my gosh, yay, I totally got triggered. Like a part of you is having this emotion that, oh my God, this really sucks. And then the other part of you is like, yay, I found another thing to work on. Like, <laughs> you know, it's right here in front of me. And so when you can be in that, that type of way within yourself, like the observer and also the feeler at the same time, then you're getting to the bottom of it. And what I see though, with sometimes the overly spiritual bypassing law of attraction positivity thing is that the minute they feel angry about something, there's a whole bunch of shame. They're like, why am I feeling this way? I shouldn't feel this way. And then that makes the emotion that much bigger, that much heavier, pushes it down farther and nothing is getting worked on. Nothing at all. You're right. Because we're still human beings having a human experience. And I think that's just a function of being a human being. These emotions are going to come up. We're supposed to feel because we're learning. It's it's right. constantly learning. Um, you mentioned the 5D. So I think it's a perfect segue to get into that topic. So you're a 5D astrologer. Before I ask you what that even means, I want to talk about what 5D is. And because I hear people keep saying we're shifting into the 5D and I'm pretty confused by that term. Right. And so essentially I want to know what shifting into 5D is and how does that differ from our three-dimensional reality and also the 4D? It's a super good question. Um well what I found really wild and I loved it and I had it on my uh website years ago when I first got my website up and running is that NASA Actually, and you you can look this up. NASA has found a way to, um, I think I'm saying this right. I could be saying it wrong, but almost like measure or touch on the different um, dimensions. Like they can measure the fourth dimension right outside the earth plane. And so again, if we just kind of, first of all, approach that concept that it's frequency. It's just like a radio station. It's an attunement. And then to go deeper into it, the third dimension is like a real close up view of a bigger picture. So it's, there's a lot of polarization. You're feeling the pockets of things very strongly and almost singularly. Like, you know, either it's, you know, real fear or real love, you know, um, like either you're in a temple or you're in the trenches, you know, it's everything is kind of polarized in a way, right? And you could even see that with the Piscean age. There's two fish. Even though it's oneness, we're all sitting in a petri dish kind of in our perspective corners, right? Taking that realm. This is good. This is bad. You know, like light and dark, like all these concepts are separate. And, and that's okay. Like that's a necessary step in a direction of understanding the depth of things and growth. But then you move to 5D and my take on that, the energy of it sees all the separateness, separateness, but we see it as an interplay off of the other. So in other words, we could look at Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader and be like, oh, Darth Vader's 
called a badass. He's bad. That guy's bad. And Luke Skywalker's the greatest. But Luke Skywalker, what? He'd be in a cave, like flipping rocks with his mind, saying, Yay, I'm the greatest Jedi. Like he's like, if he didn't have Darth Vader to give him an opportunity to see who he was, like that polarized version, neither of them would be who they are. So again, it, it, to me, the fifth dimension kind of goes, it's many things, but one of the main thing is it works in a full embodied awareness that is all necessary. There's no judgment on that's a bad guy. That's a good guy. We start to really understand, like really get it, that it's all necessary. That's interesting. And I think one of the reasons why I get, I, I used to get confused about this conversation, right? Is because people go from, we were in the 3D, now we're shifting into the 5D. I'm always like, what happened to the fourth dimension? Fourth is the, <laughs> what is the fourth dimension? Is that time? How did we skip over the fourth dimension into the fifth dimension? You know, I, I'll be honest with you. I kind of feel the same way. Like I, I appreciate the labels that we got going on. <laughs> and I'm sure somebody out there can probably delineate it better than I, but to me, it almost feels like um, the fourth dimension is a bit of a mastery. If I were to look at it as an experience, it's a mastery of the third. So it's like, you got the third dimension and you're really polarized. Right. And then you, you kind of, you're like, yeah, okay. I get it now. I get things are necessary, but you're still ultra triggered and you may be even polarized within yourself and maybe even in the fourth dimension you kind of fluctuate and you go into yes this is all necessary and then the next day you're like no those bastards you know like you get like you're in a pole you're back into the depth of your karma and then you move back and so really to me the fourth uh dimension almost feels like the holding pattern if you will um between that ultra knowing and the ultra polarized kind of like in the space movies, you know, when the astronauts are in a rocket ship and then they got to go into outer space, but they have to go into a holding tank in between to get like altitude acclimated. That's what that fourth dimension feels like. It feels almost like a holding pattern. That makes a whole lot of sense. And, you know, speaking of the fifth dimension, just kind of understanding that everything serves a purpose, what people might yes. consider negative what people might consider positive, they're all kind of working together yes. for the same good. It reminded me of something I, I heard recently from this life coach. Her name is Wumi. I don't know her last name, um, but she recently just talked about how there are mosquitoes in paradise. She talked about she was on vacation on an island and it's beautiful, it's serene, but she was struggling with mosquitoes. She was struggling with flies. When you think about paradise, you don't think about bugs biting you, right? So essentially, she was just kind of saying that, she, yeah, she was in paradise, but she also had to face mosquitoes. And that's a lot of what life is, right? That you might be having something wonderful going on in your life, but there are other things too that are falling flat, right? Like she she experienced tremendous career success, and then she also lost her um, father. Um, but then it also makes me think sometimes, right? If if we get to a stage where we believe that everything kind of worked together, right? We kind of, we're slowly moving away from duality. How do we hold space for, and I ask this question a lot of times, how do we hold space for empathy towards people who are suffering? And how do we also hold space for justice for people who are hurting other people? Because some people can make the argument, well, if everything is supposed to happen, negative things are supposed to happen, then I guess we just let bad people do what they need to do because they serve a purpose and not be held accountable. No, I, I love that. And a fun way to look at this is that like energetically, when I approach that, it's the reminder that it's this is like a fractal like a fractal existence. And so the 3D layers, the 4D layers, the 5D layers, all these other layers that we're not even talking about today, they continue forever, like eternally. It's just where our collective is kind of bumping up and even the earth plane is kind of shifting. But that doesn't mean that once we all get there, 
we won't um there won't be people in these other realms or beings or energy whatever you want to call it and so when they are in the other realms they are still the ones that want to and need to play out what those polarized stories mean so somebody gets hurt they got to play out um the realization that they want to fight for that or they want to play out what it feels like to feel that suffering and and so same with um, holding empathy, once we get to that spot, we've already been through it. So by nature, our energy understands them. And so a part of us, from my experience, we still weep for them. Like for instance, the word compassion, compassion means with, com means with, passion means suffering, with suffering. So like, for instance, if I, um, I remember when I didn't have children yet and my best friend had her babies and she's like, oh my God, you're going to love these kids more than anything in the world. And I was like, yes, I will. But no, I'm still going to love my husband more. <laughs> and don't get me wrong. I love my husband, <laughs> but there's some about the kids, right? It's like, there's a different, I get it now. I didn't get it when I was, when I didn't have the experience. And so when you walk into then a room full of mothers, everybody gets each other. Or if you suffered something terrible and you walk into like a support group, everybody there gets you because they've been through the same thing. And so when you get to this higher level of being, there's an unspoken understanding where a part of you weeps for them, but then the other part of you is like, you so got this. I'm a reflection that you've got this because I was there. I see you, I get you, and you will find your way to this. So we don't need to necessarily do it, but being of witness and holding the space for them and believing in them helps it to rise as well. Yeah, so if if I'm understanding what you're saying, just in general, right? Um, right. It's, it's understanding that all of these different dimensions, all of these different realms are existing at the same time. And we're constantly moving through our consciousness is constantly moving through these different realms and people have different things that they have to play out. And other people are kind of not to say like anyone's better than another person, but people are, are evolving in different ways and evolving to higher levels per se. And we can be of witness to other people's navigation through other dimensions um but we don't necessarily have to do anything about it but I guess like still living within this third dimensional space I think and I think somebody I was talking to earlier said that you know we can we can hold space for people who are still struggling through polarity yeah. but also hold people accountable at the same time oh yes and their souls um from my perspective, and I work a lot with past lives, their souls want that. So in other words, like I'll see people and, um, you know, when, when maybe there's not so much consciousness, when a soul comes in again, just a level, we were all there and you know, the universe is going to keep being that way. It's just new energy coming in. And so they get these powerful positions or these roles, and then they spew out, you know, all this, um, unconsciousness, just unconsciousness and destruction. Well, the next life, then they come in and they're like, okay, this time around, I'm going to experience the consequence of it. It's like a chef. You make a meal, right? You feed it, but then you got to come back around the other side of the table and taste it. That's how you get that, that full understanding. So we're essentially making our paths by, you know, whatever we've experienced, we've put out for. And so when that, when that happens in that way, then it's um, like I asked my teacher once, you know, what happens if there is like Darth Vader, you know, <laughs> and he's killed all those amazing planets with all the people on. He's like, well, he's he's got a he wants to his soul wants to experience what it feels like to be on a planet that gets demolished, wants to see what it feels like to be watching that. So you you come from all these different angles. So then when somebody comes back into this life and maybe there is some suffering there, their soul wants that because they're, 
they're like, hey, I put it out there. Now I want to know what it feels like to be whole in understanding that creation. That's the really interesting part about the past life concept, right? And how it pertains to karma, because people think that karma, we're constantly creating karma, but karma is very much connected to this, the notion of reincarnation and past lives and things we've done in previous lives, experiences we've had with previous people and kind of coming back to kind of redo those experiences to learn from it. And I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Dolores Cannon. I quote her a lot in a lot of her past life regressive, in her a lot of her past life regressive work. Um, she talks about how like a lot of people are stuck in karma loops and people keep coming back and repeating the same cycle over and over again. So in speaking of 5D, right, realizing that all things are kind of intertwined, kind of having this high level perspective about how everything kind of plays a role, including ourselves, could that potentially shift us away from constantly being in this karma loop? Because I assume that someone who is kind of like in the 5D space and not necessarily dealing in polarity and always having to like learn things and experience certain interactions, um, I assume that they're healing a lot of karma in order to kind of ascend into the 5D yeah, it's it's interesting because um, we all chose to be here in the context of this time. And so this time is, we call time, the space is the context of what our energy is really ready to, to vibe at, to energize that. And so how that reflects with past lives is that, you know, when we do complete these cycles, we have an opportunity to complete them on a nervous system level, not just on a mind level. Like some people might say, well, gosh, I like, for instance, you might say, oh, well, I moved out of a bad environment that I was in when I was a child. But then as an adult, you notice you still do some things or you still are drawn to it. That's because then you got to work with your body, your nervous system getting to those past lives, using them as tools to say, no, I don't need to go through this anymore. It really happened in other lifetimes, right? And this lifetime, I'm able to move past it, but it's really working with it that consciously that that really, really helps. And the beauty of that, what we have now, the planets are reflecting us. Planets don't happen to us. They are us. And so we are stepping into this Aquarian age. It is that of freedom and frequency. And it's giving us an environment that can support our detachment, Aquarius, detachment from those ancient wounds, which is Pluto. And Pluto's in Aquarius right now. Perfect segue into astrology. Um, <laughs> what does it mean to be a 5D astrologer? I'm, astrologer. I'm going to be um, honest. I, I know the basics when it comes to astrology. I think I know nice. my sun. I know my moon and I know my rising everything else about the planets when people are like oh like you're in this house or your planet like this planet is affecting this house I'm like I don't know what that means <laughs> I, I need to do more research I, I I will be frank but I'm I'm curious on a high level what does it mean to be a 5d astrologer and how is that different from a regular astrologer I began studying um, 5D astrology um, in 2010. I, I actually, that's when I first met my teacher, Stephanie, Stephanie Azaria. Um, she's the one who really um, brought this through. Uh, it, was, it was brought through in the 90s, actually, um, through the House of Mary and um, a couple other beings. But Stephanie has given her life to this work. And so I was so drawn to it. And now regular traditional astrology goes kind of, for starters, counterclockwise when you need to read the chart. But two things about 5D astrology that really wasn't around out loud the way it is now all those years ago is that they use, first of all, planets that are beyond like our basic, you know, Venus, Mars, Mercury, Pluto, Neptune, Saturn, like beyond those basics. It uses these other planets like Chiron or Pallas Athene or, you know, um, 
Ophiuchus, like all these other planets that that are just coming into our awareness now. So that's that's one thing. And the second thing is that instead of going counterclockwise, they kind of look at the clock in a in an actual clockwise sort of way. Everything is still the same, your sun, your moon, your rising, but they break it up different and they look at it um, and how things are affecting you in a little bit of a different way. And those 5D planets, they speak to our frequency potential that is really active right now, where we may not even see those if we're just looking at our basic planets. So it's like a support system. Okay. So the, the basic planets just kind of, I would assume go into just who you are as a person, like your design, your blueprint, yes, and maybe your potential actions that you might take in this lifetime. But I guess the 5D kind of goes a little bit deeper into your emotional body and your potential for growth in certain areas. Is, is Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah. Yeah. And it's those 5D planets. It's kind of like this, like whenever planets are found, this is so fun. Whenever a planet is discovered, they name it and give it the uh, quality of what's going on in the world when it's found, when it's discovered like at a collective level, like the scientists do it or the, you know, astrology or um, astronomers do it, you know? And so it takes on the energy of that archetype. But these 5D planets, they're only really being found out now. They're trans-Neptunian objects. They're, you know, a bunch of different things, um, centaurs. And so when we, we could see them now because of our capacity, that means that they're available in our consciousness. And so I see 5D planets really as almost like our etheric body also showing patterns because the planets give us patterns to how we love things, how we think about things, what our karma is, all this stuff, family dynamics. And these extra planets, they say, hey, we're holding space for you up here. This is your potential. So those 5D planets really show us like that higher frequency, that 5D frequency saying attuned to us, you have this to draw from. So it's like all of these extra bits that we could use in our awareness in everyday life. So is 5D connected to our higher self? Like it's yes. almost like, are we doing yes. astrology for our higher self? <laughs> yes. And it's our higher self very much integrated with, because in, in, in uh, 5D astrology, we use the everyday planets and the 5d planets so there's that beautiful integration again okay and just for the people who are listening how would you define our higher self i know that's a loaded question because i am still trying to wrap my head around it um i picture the higher self as kind of like this like energy being that has the outline of like a human body <laughs> but has like different wires sticking out of it connected to like me right now or like me in a different lifetime just like this I kind of think about it like as the soul basically I love that yes the soul I I'm right there with you because it is the soul and it's also to me like the carrot dangling in front of that horse saying you know we are here just to realize and sometimes we could get caught up in even the numerical hierarchy, like almost like 5D seems better than 3D. I even see it sometimes where we, our soul, I love that you said that, can pop in to this realm and say, I want to experience the depth of what the 3D is. Not saying that the 3D is less than the 5D or the 5D is better than the 3D or the 12th dimension is better than this. It doesn't really even feel like a better it just means, hey, I need this tool. Let me go realize and make sure that my mastery goes that deep, that deep. And so it go, it pops back in here and then, you know, and then comes back out again. And so I feel like our higher self is, is our greatest truth saying, nope, nope, come a little more. Oh, okay. You align to that truth. Good. There's always a new one aligned to this. And so it's like a sublime messaging that's always calling us towards it, giving us little clues always. Uh, that's an interesting way of putting it. And something else I, I wanted to ask as well as you were talking about 
the different planets for the 5D astrology, are those planets within our galaxy or are they planets outside of our galaxy? They are within our galaxy. There's a couple points that are bigger than that, like um, the galactic center or the great attractor. Now the galactic center is in the middle of the Milky Way. So that's still in our galaxy, but then there's the great attractor point and these are all like in Sagittarius. So they're more points than they are necessarily planets per se, but we can tangibly kind of look at um, the, the um, galactic center. And then the great attractor is like this massive void that is constantly calling planets to it, kind of one after the other. But, but for the most part, everything is within our, our universe, even though there's multiverses. And so it's our collective, it's a reflection of our collective consciousness. You just said something that I always get super excited about, and it's this concept of like the multiverse that also kind of gets very convoluted. You know, like it's just so hard to like wrap your head around because there could be, we have past lives, we have multiple lives, and then we also have multiple universes. And there could be like 10 versions of this Jumi operating in different ways based on decisions I, I'm choosing to make versus the ones I'm choosing not to make. So it's all very interesting. And I'm, I'm curious, does your work ever, when you're working with clients, do you ever go into that? concept of like potential actions based on parallel world or multiverses yes yeah and I, I could answer that a couple ways so one way to look at it is like the timelines you know we could say like okay so I made a choice on this timeline and then I could feel choices in other timelines and I have this program called into the mystic that I created about six years ago specifically I mean I had been doing this work for you know, 15, 20 years up to that point. But I, I created it specifically because this is where my work would always take me, where <clears throat> I go in and I, I go into each chakra and specifically, it's like a certain way that I do it. It's, it's not just any past life. It's a specific past life in the theme of the chakra. And when I close that lifetime down, when I witness it and I close that trauma down and I call it back home, what I always see is that there's all these trajectory lifetimes that happened because of that one big wound. And so the minute you make peace with that one big wound, all these other trajectory lifetimes collapse and they come back home. Now I tell my clients before we even begin the journey, because it's like an eight week process. I said, you might start to feel some waves of grief or sadness or any other kind of emotion that you're like, Hey, where is this coming from? And I tell them, let it flow because you are grieving the closing out of those timelines. And while I use the word past life, I use it because it denotes a different awareness that we had that was maybe, you know, before we are today, but I don't even feel that time was past. Like I honestly see these lifetimes, no matter what year it was, they all collapse and they come back home today. Like they're happening now. They're happening now in accordance with this one particular time and space. And I'll even have people who are beyond this time and space that I've seen. And they are projecting their energy into our dimension, which we see as less than where they are, which again, to me, there's no hierarchy. It's just experience. So they project it in here. And it's, it's amazing because it's happening simultaneously. Like it's all happening at one time. It just depends on what frequency you really want to hone in on. I geek out about the whole concept of like the multiverse and different it's potentials and all that stuff. It's just, it's just incredible to think about because the world is just so, the universe, everything is so expansive. And like, the more you think, you know, the less, you know, you just keep unearthing and uncovering things over and over and over again. Something I did want to ask you again, related to the 5D um, was just like, I know that we talked about how everything serves a purpose, right? And like you're a medium, you're an intuitive healer. You you do a lot of work in, in the psychic realm. 
you can you probably come across I assume light beings and beings from lower vibrations and that stuff can be very scary for people so do you deal with lower vibrational entities and what are your thoughts on 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 dealing with those types of entities because I always assume that the more spiritual someone is the closer they just want to be with the light and protect themselves from negative entities really you like really touched on one of one of my all-time favorite topics <laughs> and it's sometimes it's not too popular but oh well it's a uh, it's how i work and everybody finds their way um i love to invite people back to what we talked about in the beginning of this reading or this um this recording here where everything is energy first so keep that in mind as we move through what you're speaking to here, um, what you're asking. So when we, I, I absolutely work with, and I love how you called them lower vibe beings. I don't call it light and dark. And I'll tell you, I, I get the concept. You know, it feels like light and yes, it looks like light. But for me, the light has a spectrum of energy and the dark has a spectrum of energy. When we just kind of delineate, oh, it's just light and dark, it reminds me a little bit of when I was a little girl and I used to think that like um, cats were girls and dogs were boys. <laughs> like I, it was perfect. I mean, it, it captured the essence, right? Like you freaking almost got to see that. I mean, totally. I mean, I'm right. But then as you get older, you realize that there's um, more of a spectrum inside of those concepts. And so I've worked with some light beings where all that glitters is not gold. And to me, I, I actually, I'm in the midst of writing a book called Dark Matters because the dark is the womb. The dark is the yin. It's the feminine. It is the mystic. It is the unknown. And if we reject the dark completely because of that simplistic view, we're missing a whole lot of creative potential. So what I do instead, because I have had some low vibe, I just look at it as low vibe and high vibe. And I've had some really low vibes. So what do you do? Instead of protection, I don't, I don't do the protection thing. And, and I'll tell you why. It's because like, if you and I played a little game. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. But it doesn't work for everybody, it, you know, but it's, it's the way I do it. So imagine, just even right now, if we played, even if the listeners played, Imagine, go to a real high vibe place in your soul right now. Like close your eyes, really get there. Like get the smells, see the people, feel the joy, or just if there's no people, just be immersed in the environment. Like really, 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 really feel that in your body. Just take a moment to feel it. Now say to yourself, I need to protect myself against. What happens the minute you say that? fear the vibe goes away yeah. and so you're when you say i need to protect myself against you're calling it in because everything is energy first you are activating the very frequency that you're trying to stay away from so what do we do instead we own whatever we believe protects us out there it's time for us to kind of level up and own those angels the archangels whatever we feel that potential is own it get attuned to that high vibe so high. It's like a radio station that, that the low vibe can, it misses you. It's like you're wearing the Harry Potter cloak. It's like you're wearing the Harry Potter invisible invisibility cloak because your frequency is so attuned to a certain vibe that anything that's lower than that cannot find you unless it attunes to that very vibration. Mm. I do that instead of protection. Okay, so if I'm understanding what you're saying, you're yes. saying it's less about asking for protection. It's more right. about your frequency. Like if you're yes. different vibrations, you attract the vibration that you're on. So if you're in a higher vibration or in a more light vibration, lower, you don't need to ask for protection from lower entities because they wouldn't even be able to match your vibration. Right. And right. when you call in that protection, you're essentially saying that that could potentially even like yeah. attract them because it. now they're like, oh, well, they might be sensing fear, right? Because yeah. when when I was picturing myself, I was picturing myself in this like endless 
like lawn with like beautiful flowers and I was sitting in it. And as soon as you were like, uh, say to yourself, I want to protect myself from, I felt like fear in my body. But I've also heard that sometimes when you do this work, right, because you have to open yourself in, like you're almost kind of like a, <laughs> a channel, channel, right? Yeah. Right. So like if you're reading for someone, for example, you might be of high vibration, but you're trying to tap into their energetic field, right? And yeah. sometimes that person could have low vibrational entities around them. Because I've heard that because you are, we are channeled, especially people who do this work and practice this work and have really like fine tuned their gift and they use it all the time, that there is, you know, when you open yourself up, you are potentially opening yourself up to to almost anything, like even people who, I would say you're very seasoned, right? You're an expert here. Like you, you know what you're doing, but for someone like me, let's say I go take ayahuasca. I've heard so many stories about people are so open that anything kind of comes to them because like, we just, they haven't gotten to the point where they can really like be confident in the energy that they they are in, right? So what I, would you say to that? Because I, I kind of see, I hear what you're saying, but I also see the the potential need for protection. So we're not just like channeling things to us, if that makes any sense. Oh, no, no, no. You are super spot on. And you're just talking about, you've touched on another layer that is to me, like the stickler of when I teach my clients or students about this is a, a word that I call, I use, it's called energetic hygiene. <laughs> so remember those other three bodies, right? They, we have three bodies that are more energetic and then the one that's physical, but what do we do? We're washing our hands all the time. We can't get enough antibacterial, this and that. We're brushing our teeth. We're doing our hair. When was the last time we cleaned our energy? I do it morning, noon, and night. And so perhaps instead of the word protection, we can use the word awareness. So when you are really present and you are home and you are owning your space, and I do, I worked with a, a client, uh, uh, gosh, uh, maybe like last spring and um, almost a year ago now. And she had me read for her and whoo, oh man, low vibe. And her husband was a Satanist. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, like I've been into these low vibe beings and, and I noticed that when that does show up, it's because it's an initiation. We're leveling up a little bit more. So what do we have to do? We have to become stronger in the frequency. So it's not like I'm walking around saying, no, my vibe is perfect. I, every moment of the day, whether I'm having a reading or talking to you or going to Trader Joe's, I am, I am doing energetic hygiene. I'm grounded. It's my frequency, my frequency alone. You know, I'm, I'm always coming home to myself. And when I work with my clients, um, I'm very aware of that. We are non-local entanglement. We're entangling, right? And so I always intend highest frequency for them, highest frequency for me, only the highest frequency. And I, and that's what you get. This isn't so much like Hollywood where, you know, the, like the ghosts kind of rule the world. I mean, yeah, they could go through walls and stuff like that. But when you own, when you own your body, your energy and your space, and you say, nope, only the highest frequency for me, it's, it's like, um, that's, that's all I've ever needed. And there have been super scary times. And so I have to work harder to say, nope. And I get into a mantra and I really get that high vibe going. And I work on that beautiful grassy place and I turn up all those things. And it's like, they slide right off. Cannot see it. That's, that's a good point. I like the analogy that you made where you said that, you know, when we talk about the immune system, you have to expose yourself to bacteria yes. in order to strengthen your immunity. You can't people, you get more sick or they said that babies who are super clean and never really play in the dirt, their parents don't really let them, you know, play in the dirt or anything like that tend to get sicker a lot quicker because their immune system hasn't, you know, gone up. So I, I see right. what you're saying. Yeah. It seems like that's the analogy that you're making that sometimes those low vibrations 
especially people who do your work, it's kind of like a leveling up of strengthening your energetic immunity. So I that, love so, that. Yeah. I love that. May I use that, Jimmy, when I'm <laughs> yes. teaching? Because I yes. think that that is the best. I yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that that does make sense. Um. So yeah, that that's that's a very good perspective. I it's given me a lot to think about because I'm definitely I I do pray for general you know protection because I feel like I don't feel confident in the ability to hone in and ground into myself in order to detach from right. those things. Right. Um, so yes, I, I I see both sides to that. And you'll find your way. You know, yeah. there's no right or wrong. You have to go with what feels best. Yes. And, you know, I, so I, that's just um, the way that I have found myself to the, to work. And I love that you say that because you think about it with babies, why were they made to crawl so close to the earth before strollers were even like, those were just invented Mm -hmm. in the grand scope of human beings. So we are down to be in it. And so we could even think about that spiritually as well. Like we are meant to engage with others energetically but when we bring more awareness the awareness the awareness of the high vibe of what we want that adjusts everything yes oof that was good so this has been a great conversation and you yes. know we went down a rabbit hole which was so fun to do it was fun so so fun sure. and because the show is called shifting dimensions i usually like to close out with a fun question for my guests which is, have you shifted in perspective on anything lately? And it could be super lighthearted, like you maybe changed your diet or your exercise routine, or it could be as deep as you want it to be. Yes, I have shifted in a huge way that, um, and I'm not fully there, but social media isn't as scary as I thought it was going to be. Because I've, I literally like just started Instagram, I don't know, a couple months ago. And um, I just, you know, all my clients have been word of mouth, but I did not like it. And even the podcasting is always kind of scary, but I've been doing it now for about a year and woo. So it's been a big, it's been a big shift to embrace technology. It's just, um, I'm leaning into it and I'm working on it every day. So that was my big shift. Yay. I'm still learning. I, that Are you okay? Shift for me too. So I'm, I'm right there uh-huh. with you, Janine. Um, <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Where can people find you if they want to work with you? I know you said that you have um, a conference coming up as well. I do. Uh, You can find me at janinekim.com. And uh, on Instagram, it's themystic.janinekim. I don't have much there, but I pay attention. I look. And um, and, uh, and I have, uh, yes, a retreat coming up March 8th, 9th, and 10th in Santa Fe, New Mexico with Dr. Jeffrey Terrence. And it's called Becoming Psychic, Bridging the Gap Between Science and Spirituality. He's a scientist. I'm a psychic. And we've come together for the past few years. I'm in his book called Becoming Psychic. So check out his book. And um, he measures, he maps my brain and all psychics. He works with tons of psychics. And he sees how our brain shifts when we do this. And and we want to teach people that this is something that we all do. It isn't just like, you know, crazy people like me. (laughs) No, I love that. Bridging the gap between science and spirituality. I, I love that. I, I need to have him on the show as well. That's awesome. He's um, awesome. Yeah. He's yeah. Good. <laughs> Thank you again, Janine, for stopping Welcome. by Shifting Dimensions. Thank you for having me. I loved it. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Thank you.